This is JCU Conversations, a podcast show from James Cook University, Singapore. Tune in as we ask experts in the industry more about their lives and their approach to success. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's listen to today's episode. Hi, I'm Lucy Tan, Associate Professor in Clinical Psychology from James Cook University, Singapore. My guest today is Dr. Melvin Heng, Executive Director and Group Chief Executive Officer at Thomson Medical. Dr. Heng brings to the table a unique blend of medical expertise, executive leadership and entrepreneurship with well over a decade of experience in diverse areas such as hospital management, primary and specialist clinics, teleradiography, med tech and aeromedical evacuations. Before stepping into corporate leadership, Dr. Heng was a medical doctor in UK and Singapore. Beyond the traditional medical trajectory, his career has seen some notable highlights. For instance, he is co-founder of an aeromedical evacuation company and was also an equity partner at the chain of primary care health clinics. Today, Dr. Heng also leverages his expertise as a medical advisor and investor in multiple medtech companies. Welcome, Dr. Heng. And Hi. thank you so much for Thanks, doing Lucy. this. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure. So, yeah. So JCU Conversations is a very casual chit chat. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so it's basically about um, engaging with our industry partners. We converse about your success and your achievements. And wow, you know, what a wealth of experience. So how about you introduce yourself and tell the audience a bit more about your role in Thomson Medical. So yeah, thanks thanks so much, Lucy, and to JCU for the opportunity and hi to all that are watching. Um, currently in Thomson Medical, I'm group CEO. So I, I oversee the entire operations in um, Singapore, Malaysia, and recently Vietnam, as we have just acquired a hospital there and a couple of clinics there as well. Um, so that involves the day-to-day -day running of the hospitals. Um, we have a, a fleet of uh, IVF fertility clinics as well. And you know we are cu currently on the pathway to um, disrupting ourselves digitally by building more digital infrastructure um, for, for process improvement, for improvement of the hospital and you know patient journey. So there's quite a lot of parts that are moving. Mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, um, my role involves splitting myself into an operator, um, a strategic leader, um, sometimes a coach, um, many times even dealing with the local politics because healthcare does, you know, touch on the fabric of society quite a bit. And in any healthcare organization within a country, there's a lot of community impact and you know, a lot of um, um, dialogue with regulators and the ministry on, you know, how they want to bring healthcare in, in their own countries. So th there's a mix of both. And 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 lastly, last but not least, is, um, is a stakeholder management of my physicians, which are one of our key, you know, um, 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 operators of the hospitals and, and, and you know, main um, support that we have to bring the type of healthcare that we want to our patients. Mm. It sounds really complex, isn't it? All those challenges with um. Yeah, I didn't expect yeah. it to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems like I I have a knack for choosing complexity. Um, I think I chose to be a doctor because I thought previously I wanted to be an aeronautics engineer. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the most complicated part of engineering, and and then I chose medicine because I thought, you know, healthcare. You, you know, the human body is even more complex. And then I end up in healthcare management, which um, it is complex in many ways. And I, I think as we talk more, it, you'll that some color will come out on, yeah. on why I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you have having to train as a medical doctor and you've practiced medicine for a while and then navigate it and transition across to management and executive management of quite a large healthcare, hospital, and clinics. How did you manage those challenges? I think um, you manage by going back to first principles. I think um, 
I had the luxury or maybe the way things serendipitously panned out for me was that when I first started leaving clinical practice, um, you know, the, the work that I was doing and the management scope and size was more bite-sized. Mm. You know, I started off with a small outfit, you know, um, based in Singapore and Sri Lanka. We were running uh, um, aeromedical evacuations for patients, you know, um, well and unwell patients across the region. And then because of that, we, I, I had a couple of uh, other uh, friends and colleagues that, you know, were starting into primary care. And we grew from one clinic in, and all the way to 25 clinics before I left. And in between, we had a few more ventures. We had another um, electronic medical record company, which we exited um, to a Hong Kong listed company. Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, after that, I was also looking at healthcare analytics. And um, that's why I was in another company doing metabolomics. And that was just started. And I was also in Berlin, mm -hmm. um, starting another company doing teleradiology. Mm -hmm. And so the, the scale just got, you know, incrementally bigger as mm -hmm. I followed my curiosity. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed it. Um, I probably was too busy to realize the complexity and the scale was just getting yeah. larger. And that around that time, that's when I joined um, IHH um, and I was um, at Glen Eagles and became CEO there after a, a period of six years. And then um, I moved to Thompson um, in the last 14 months mm. uh, to to take on the role as, as group CEO there wow. with, with more complexity. Yeah. But... Um, I've always found the work challenging, but immensely satisfying and fulfilling. And that keeps me going. I think how you manage that is that you need to really find out what drives you. And I realized that even if I didn't have that job, I probably will still be doing what I'm doing um, within the healthcare space. And I'm a huge evangelist for you know good, well thought out healthcare systems. And I realized that, you know, I would probably continue with what I was doing anyway. So um, it became a very natural extension of my own interests and passions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and with that wealth of being in executive positions, in, in leadership positions, is there anything you miss from your medical practitioner days? I think until recently, because um, you know, if if you are CEO of a hospital, you still touch the ground quite a bit. You talk to your doctors every day. You probably have breakfast with them, and then you meet the nurses, and you actually talk to patients, and you 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 know you you have the ones that are happy and the ones that are not so happy, and and a lot of it is based on clinical issues. So mm -hmm. generally, you still use your clinical acumen and your knowledge quite on a daily basis. Um, currently, in my current role as a, more of a portfolio manage, manager, um, I'm a little bit more far removed. And what I miss is the, funny enough, is probably the, the hustle and bustle and the complexity and the complaints and the feedback and the constant barrage of um, <laughs> issues, actually, um, that come from the ground. Um, sometimes very seemingly... Uh, unimportant but you know friction nonetheless that you you know that you need to fix and some of those fixes are a little bit easier um at a at a more corporate portfolio level i think it's a more financial role and more strategic role mm -hmm. a little bit more far removed but the excitement that i get is from looking at things that scale and the scale is actually very exciting as well because then you know the impact that you have is is much larger mm -hmm. um i I wish I could have my cake and eat it. Um, once in a while, I still get glimpses of you know, op operational issues that I need to step down to help and sort out. And that gives me a lot of, uh, <laughs> some sort of you know, um, fam familiarity and comfort as well. You know? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm back to dealing with hospital issues. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a natural progression and uh, you know and, and that's another chapter that I have to write mm -hmm. and so it's uh, something that I embrace quite happily yeah yeah it's always such a fine line between um you know hospital governance and management and balancing the books as opposed to on the ground you know the clinical day-to-day -day grind of issues yes. yeah yes. so um 
with that balancing mm. act in mind, is that in itself a challenge for you? It's a beautiful challenge. Um, balancing business mm. and commercial yeah. um, priorities with 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 um, healthcare needs. I I like healthcare business and because it's 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 hard to balance, mm. right? There are things that I wish I could do mm. that you can't. Mm. You can't because <clears throat> if you ask a, a, a CEO of most com companies what is you know what's at the top of their mind, and the more, a lot of them will say, well, it's to maximize shareholder value, right? Yeah. And you ask a hospital CEO, mm. and he says, oh, I um, what's at the top of my mind? Making sure that my patients come and leave better than the yeah. way they came in. Absolutely. So there's no other way to yeah. say it. You can't say anything else, right? Yeah. And that, yeah, that at the back of your mind, you're thinking, you know, I still need to keep the ship going. I still need to make sure that we, we earn enough to, you know, continue to pay the nurses, buy the latest equipment, mm. you know, keep tabs of the what's the latest MRI or mm. <laughs> robots that are yeah. in, in the, the yeah. So you, you're having that at the back of your mind, but at the same time, you have all these constraints. If if you were Grab, you could do things like price surge. You could do. <laughs> if you were in the airline business, you might do price opacity and make yeah. you know buying tickets on Tuesday cheaper than buying tickets on yeah. Saturday. Mm. Um, but you can't do that in healthcare. Yeah. You can't have a price surge because the high there's high demand. Um, you can't have price opacity because you know you, it it just doesn't work. It doesn't the, the industry can't doesn't demand of that right. And you mm. can't you just can't. Um, be put in that position with your patients as well. So yeah. transparency is extremely important, you know, being open, you know, being able to um, to to put the ethical considerations is su supremely important. And mm. I think that fine balance is actually mm. very difficult to, to achieve. And you get that in every industry in healthcare, every sector from pharmaceuticals to devices to services, um, you know, you have to find that balance somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, a, 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 a big skill set, I think. What, what advice would you have for, say, our audience where, you know, they may not conceptualise healthcare and healthcare industry to be a business model? And there's more and more of such an issue these days with increasing healthcare costs. I mean, those are your daily challenges. And um, there's so much currently on digital transformation, um, aging mm. population, um, falling fertility rates. So those are the kind of challenges, I guess, you with your strategic hat on will mm. have to kind of manage and problem solve. Is that something that drives you continuously with much excitement? Yes. Um Despite all the big global challenges, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, of course. You know, I, I think we must not shy away from having open conversations about this. I mean, mm. um, but there's a lot that we can do to increase access to healthcare. I, I give you an example. I mean, um, I actually work pretty closely with World Bank, with International Finance Corporation, and they are they are bodies that are you know looking for huge community impact right mm. and and they run vaccination programs for third world countries and they they write policies that only materialize or demonstrate their effectiveness 15 years into mm. the making right mm. um and you know if if you could make tweaks to policy with the amount of you know you talked about digital transformation the amount of data you have you could leverage so much on access to healthcare. Um, if I give you an example, can I success load treatments? If I know that the treatment will be 60% successful, um, how do I you know, get those that are successful to pay more, right? Um, I, I just don't know who are the 60 people that will be successful, but if I could you know, get that policy through, then I could actually reduce the cost and either standardize the cost of the pre-treatment and i could probably you know treat a larger proportion of people with the comfort that you know those that were not successful in the treatment would 
uh, not be out of pocket any more than what we have advertised or given to them or you know put out before them and those that are success successful you know there will be the payers that would cover the cost mm -hmm. and and in in healthcare um, uh, dynamics and um, 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 economics you know this this pl applies across both private and public institutions because you are talking about population healthcare right so mm -hmm. you you need to balance the books whether you're yeah. a politician or you're running a, a smaller company you still have to do that so um, I think that the, the I, I think I'm just trying to weave what you talk about data mm -hmm. and about digital transformation into mm -hmm. that governance part. Yeah. You you do with with with, a, with with the amount of information that we have now, we are possibly being led to make better decisions or at least being able to solve for more complex problems. Mm -hmm. And you know, almost I dare say, have our cake and eat it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I think the only way is is to to engage in this crucible of conversation with with multiple parties each of them putting forth you know their their best case uh each of them pushing their their interests which i think is absolutely fair but at the same time you know being cognizant that there must be some give and take in order to get the best solution yeah. for for all parties yeah yeah that's interesting and um so tell me about your current projects because i know medical thompson doesn't just um it's not just based in Singapore. You have some um, outlets in Vietnam and Malaysia. Yeah. Are there exciting topics coming up or projects? I, I think um I think the, the company is has is changing. I think mm -hmm. um I've joined in the last thirteen, fourteen months and, and I think the the reason um um, some of the, the the early conversations I've had with the stakeholders is is really that we're looking for growth and change uh, to be a Southeast Asian healthcare company. Mm. Um, so the way that we orientate ourselves and the way that we build our foundations is changing. We um, we believe in hospitals and ambulatory care centers, and you know building and right sighting the type of intensity of work in the right type of centers for the right type of cost structure. Mm. But at the same time, you know, we are also um, pivoting into other areas that we think are of high value and increased need. Mm. Um, we, you know, having a heritage of treating women and children in our Singapore flagship, we realize that, you know, we actually have an opportunity to be a, a standard bearer for um, reproductive medicine and fertility treatment. Mm. So um, looking into those areas, not just in the form of services, but in technology, mm. I think over the last decade probably we have seen a lot of technology in cryopreservation in metabolomics understanding the envi uh, embryo environment in micro robotics you know we recently last year saw the first uh, artificial insemination of um, sperm into egg via robotics mm. um, we are um, looking at um, how um, AI imaging is helping us select the best embryos for implantation for the best outcomes and success and we are investing in those technologies we are looking at microfluidics wow. and how that you know um, allows us to to pick you know the best uh, maybe sperm you know mm. that will have the highest chances of success in fertilization and um, as as lifestyles change and as you know um, reproductive age you know increases we actually see that you know the that they are changing and higher demands and I think um, that is that is an area that we think that a lot of technology and a lot of knowledge is is being poured out, um, and it's great as well because it really under helps us to understand how. I almost tell people it's almost understanding the fingerprint of God, right? You are trying to understand how you know how we replicate, you know, mm -hmm. at, at a very very foundational level, and and I think that's one of the areas. Yeah. The last part that we are driving is um, digital infrastructure, and I think that most healthcare companies. Um, need to invest heavily in you know building um, their virtual space i think most of our patients are demanding of de mm. demanding that mm. and it's not just an app it's really understanding everything i think i alluded from from superficial level all the way to the data le level okay. so a lot of uh, work has to be done in 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 understanding and um, building that part up as well and yeah. i think i could go on forever but mm -hmm. i i will leave it as <laughs> these three main points yeah. yeah okay and so you know you, you spoke about growth and personal development if you were to time travel back what would be the advice you give to your younger self 
I would have a lot of advice to give my 21 year old self, but I I think something that I I I I I I think to be true is to tell myself that there are only two people you need to impress, um, the eight year old version of yourself and the 80 year old version of yourself, and and I think that helps me to remain true. Mm, okay, and um, if the audience were to reach out to you, where would they find you online? Um, they could probably look for me on LinkedIn, um, or just by searching Melvin Heng, and and I, I guess I we could include my email as well in the link somewhere. Okay, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Lucy.